Hello and welcome everyone to the Anti-Racist Strategies in Dramaturgy Roundtable. Um, I want to start with a few thanks and acknowledgements before we begin. Um, I want to say thank you to the Society for Theatre Research for their generous support in making this event happen. Um, thank you to HowlRound for partnering with us to platform this uh, roundtable. And uh, thank you to my colleagues at the Dramaturgs Network, including Tomo, Sarah and Catalin for helping to make this happen. And of course, thank you to the audience and participants uh, without whom this event wouldn't be possible. Um, my name is Lee. Uh, I am one of the organizers of this year's uh, Dramaturgs Network event. Um, I'm a writer, dramaturg and educator, and I mostly work in a freelance capacity across organizations and companies to support the development of new work. Um, I also want to briefly introduce, uh, you can't see them necessarily, but I want to introduce um, Adam, our technical wizard, who's going to be uh, working away in the background to make sure things run smoothly. And um, I also want to briefly introduce our panellists, although they will obviously introduce themselves in more detail shortly. Uh, we have Lynette Goddard, uh, Kane Husbands, uh, Samantha Ellis and Sudar Bukar uh, joining the session uh, this evening. Um, I want to give some really brief context for um, the, the audience and listeners who perhaps haven't um, who are perhaps not familiar with the starting point for this session where it first began. Uh, so this event was um, organized to help build up a dialogue started in an open letter circulated in March 2021 by over 140 artists from the global majority. Um, this uh, was titled, We Need to Talk About Dramaturgy. Um, the signatories addressed 11 key points about dramaturgical practice and what they defined in the letter as, quote, patterns of injury, unquote, um, experienced by artists of colour whose work had come into contact with Eurocentric dramaturgical practices. Um, the letter went on to address several topics, including accountability, uh, dramaturgical processes in script and new work development, uh, the commissioning process, the predominance of so-called objective criteria or universal criteria for what makes a great play. Um, and all of these aspects of the letter are what we will be covering this evening in this discussion. Uh, so this round table really is about bringing together writers, artists, uh, scholars and theatre makers from the global majority uh, to consider the question, how do we collectively move beyond the narratives and forms of Eurocentric dramaturgy? and towards a decolonized model of creating and developing work collectively. We want to ask the question as well, uh, what does change look like and how can dramaturgical practice, uh, new, or, uh, new or established, help shape this change? Um, before I introduce the, um, before the panelists introduce themselves, I should say, um, just a few reminders. Uh, this round table is 90 minutes in length. Um, there'll be a 15, 20 minute uh, section for questions and answers. And um, it will be archived and recorded as well. So if you know of anybody who can't be here this evening to watch it live, um, then there will be a version of this available um, on the DN website following uh, broadcast. Um, and that's everything from me. I'm going to hand over now to Lynette Goddard, who is our chair. Um, I'm going to bring them in. So just give me a moment. Lynette, uh, over to you. Hi, Lee. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you. And, and welcome again to everybody who's um, watching this event. Um, I'll be your chair for this evening. Uh, yes, my name's um, Professor Lynette Goddard, and I'm a professor of Black Theatre and Performance at uh, the Department of Drama, Theatre and Dance at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and my research interests are really around uh, Black British uh, for most years, it's been playwriting, so Black British playwriting, looking at questions like uh, identity politics in the plays and questions around kind of race, representation and performance, and also looking at uh, Black um, adaptations of European um, dramas as well. Uh, and I'm currently working on a project that's specifically focused on um, how we capture the careers of Black British directors. It's particularly about Paulette Randall, but also uh, Black British directors. How do we capture their careers? Um, and I'm joined by three speakers, uh, three panellists, who I will now invite each to introduce themselves. So we have, uh, first of all, Sudar Bukar uh, from Tamasha, formerly of Tamasha Theatre Company. Uh, hi, Lynette and everyone. You know, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Sudha Butcher and I am an actor, playwright, um, what I call a slasher, you know, um, 
sort of having to do everything that's required to put on theatre. I am the co-founder of Tamasha Theatre Company with Christine London-Smith, and I've set up my company, Butcher Boulevard, in 2017 in my post-Tamasha freelance career. Um, and, you know, as a dramaturg, although I, you know, I found it really difficult to sort of own that term, but, you know, I have sort of helped and steered writers, often, you know, all actually writers of colour and mostly doing their debut plays. So I'm sure, you know, we'll talk about that um, as the discussion goes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sudar. Um, and then uh, we have Kane Husbands. Hello, everyone, and hi, Lynette and Lee. Hi. Thanks for having us. I'm really excited to be here and grateful for the um, for this space and that this conversation is even happening, really. Um, I am a lecturer in performance design and practice at Central St. Martins, um, and I also am the founder of a theatre company called The Pappy Show. Um, the Pappy Show is an ensemble company. We focus on training. And the majority of our work really that we've performed has been around identity, gender, race. Um, uh, our next show is called What Do You See? So we're just at the minute in, um, in de, kind of about to go into rehearsals and that's as part of the MIME Festival to be on in January. And that's all about difference and thinking about how do we hold spaces that allow many identities to thrive? Um, and what does that look like? So I'm right in, in the belly of the beast at the moment of thinking about dramaturgy of that show. So it's great to be zooming out and having a wider thing. Thanks, Lena. Great, thank you very much. And then um, our third panelist today is uh, Samantha Ellis. So if you just um, introduce yourself, thanks, Samantha. Hi, thanks, Lynette, and hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Um, yes, I'm, well, mostly a playwright, um, and um, I've written a lot of plays um, that have sprung, I suppose, out of my experience of um, my parents uh, are Iraqi Jews and they were refugees from Baghdad. So a lot of my work centers on that. Um, I also write books um, and I work a little bit on film. I work a little bit sometimes as a script editor for film. So I guess I sort of had the dramaturgy from both angles a little bit. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so just as uh, Lee has given in, in his a brief introduction. Um, the session is really in first part and in the large part a response to the open letter. We need to talk about dramaturgy. Uh, we'll be focusing on kind of, yeah, what, what is the problem? Let's identify some of the issues. Let's uh, reflect again upon some of the challenges that were outlined in the letter. Um, and then the, we'll move on after that to kind of think about the question of change. Uh, what does change look like? What needs to happen? Uh, do we have some ideas about um, how we might decolonize dramaturgy? This is both inside and outside of kind of institutional context. And then lastly, we'll think about um, dramaturgical practices. So what practices are there that are currently within dramaturgy that might help? Or and what practices can we devise? How might those practices need to be remodeled and, and reshaped so that they can really um, embrace this question of um, anti-racism and change. Um, and then uh, there'll be about 15, at least 15, uh, possibly a little bit more minutes um, time for questions from people that are watching. So if you have questions, please post them up in the chat and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Um, so if we can have um, all, pan all panelists um, visible and we'll, we'll open up this uh, discussion and uh, Welcome. Yeah, it's good to see your it's good to see your faces again. Um, so I think I mean I guess I think we'll start really with this question of Eurocentric uh, dramaturgy. Um, this idea of uh, us uh, a dramaturg as helping a writer to get to the best possible play, and the kind of question that's in the letter around well, what is the criteria for the best? Like who's best is the best? What, where, where do we learn what is the best? What, what kind of uh, values and, and uh, assumptions are we bringing in? Where, where have they come from? And um, how might we start to, to, to challenge them? How are we all? I was really interested in the thing saying, you know, we're all trained through the Eurocentric gaze. So no matter whether you're, um, let's say, a white dramaturg or a, a, a person of the global majority, you're trained through the same... Uh, structures around what is the best play. So I just wanted to kind of open up, first of all, with with 
uh, whether anyone on the panel has any responses to this question of the best and how it's either shaped your work or, um, yeah. So just wonder if anyone's got any thoughts. Kane, you took a break. Yeah, I can go. Um, it's interesting, <laughs> this idea of best, because it makes me think of like even form and style and to go like, my family are Caribbean, so to think of ideas of performance over there, it's not a style of, like my auntie's sitting around a table telling stories, is performance. Mm. That is where I learned performance. And to think that they now need to make it a little bit more authentic or to tone it down a little bit, or it's like, but in a way that's becoming less authentic in performance style. So the idea of best, it's like, by whose gaze? Who's like, who's quantifying this concept of best? When we started The Puppy Show and our first show, Boys, I guess we're not from a writer-led um, uh, practice. That's not how we make our work necessarily, but we do work with dramaturgs, visual dramaturgs, um, to think about how we carving meaning for an audience. And we didn't really have anywhere to take our work because it's not a play, so you can't put it on in our theatre, and it's not a dance, so you can't put it here. So really, I'm so glad I held tight to the form that we found and that it's found and carved its its space because actually we would have adapted and changed and squashed and cut out and made it more words and wrote it all down and, and lost the identity of what we were effectively trying to say to appeal to somebody else's best. And so do you think then that the, 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 the fact that you're, you said not writer-led, so the fact that your work is within a maybe a... Um, uh, movement forms or forms that that um, uh, maybe the kind of European gaze ha might not be able to kind of govern. Do you think that that's helped you to be freer then in, in your... I think so. Practice? I think having uh, our work is devised and mm. we um, and we mainly really play ourselves. We're not really that often playing characters. We've really recognised that our oral histories, that's how they got passed down. They, mm. You won't go to the library and hear about our people, the people mm. that we make work of. So for me, us being ourselves and voicing our stories, our histories, our futures of what we want our worlds to be, our utopias, mm. um, is it in a way saying that our lives matter, mm. uh, that mm. our stories are important. Mm. I always come back to this idea that like, you could walk around my grandma's house and you would see a museum, a black, curated museum and art gallery that is photos that she's taken and put up and it's going to be very different to walking around one of the museums in London you won't mm -hmm. see it and it's as special so I often think of our work in that same way mm. that it's been curated by these artists in a different mm. way and it might not mm. appeal to everybody Mm. So interesting because there was also something in the the letter around the kind of the, the, the dramaturg's experience and you know if you're a dramaturg that is not of a, of, of the cultural experience for the work that you're dramaturg in what, what does it mean when you try to kind of um, shift that work towards something that maybe you're more familiar with I don't know if uh, Samantha or, or Sudar you have anything to just to say I, at I this point a lot of, um... Oh, sorry, Samantha. I'll come to you after, Samantha. <laughs> a lot of what you're saying, Kane, you know, completely resonates. I mean, I think for me, you know, the journey of running Tamasha, you know, we've absolutely had to navigate, um, you know, the gatekeepers at theatres, doing, you know, work that, it, you know, in a sense, in con in context might be Eurocentric in shape, but in content, it's it's exactly, you know, us making our own work, wanting our own voice. And, you know, a lot of the time, what we realize there's a sort of disparity of discourse between the audiences. Like if, say, for example, we did a play called Strictly Dandia, which was about the Gujarati community during the festival of Navratri, the constituency audiences was full of, you know, Gujarati people who had been part of the engagement. And yet the, the show gets written about and badly reviewed by Charlie Spencer in The Telegraph, you know, who sat in the audience with 500 Gujaratis who loved it and said, mm -hmm. you know, you captured us, but the person, you know, the, the who's judging what's best is not from that, you know. So in a sense, that climate, you know, has is changing and it's great to see, um, you know, that's just one example. But if I could just say a little bit, like what I've now come to in my journey, you know, my personal journey, 
is I'm making a lot of work like co-created within communities. And so mm -hmm. during lockdown, I did a project around the theme of touch, uh, which was at Revoluton and, you know, Welcome Collection. And actually, all of that work was exactly what you say, Kane. It's like I work a lot from verbatim. I put myself in it. So, you know, it's very explicit that this is the voice of real people talking to the writer, Siddha, you know, who is mm -hmm. in that work. And that's the gaze, but we're doing it together, as it were. Um, you know, and, and that's similarly, you know, the recent show I did with, with Tara, which is Final Farewell, you know, where people shared their stories of loss during COVID. So, so where's the dramaturg and where's the writer and where's the, you know, in a sense, they're all intermingled. Um, mm. But anyway, that's probably enough Ooh, at the great, moment. Thank you. So much to talk about. I'm right? going to come back to the question of gatekeeping straight after um, Samantha has uh, spoken, actually. yeah. Mine sort of touches on gatekeeping a bit. I mean, I've had so many experiences. Um, for example, I had a meeting with a dramaturg who um, we were trying to schedule a reading of a play about Orthodox Jews. And it was December and he wanted to do it at 5 p.m. on a Friday. And I said, well, it's that we can't can we do it any other day um i said it will be even awkward i mean i'm not religious but i go to my mum so i was like it'll be even awkward for me but we're not going to get the people we want and um he was not jewish and he said no but i know the jewish sabbath's on a saturday and i was like mm, in that situation would you really question a jewish person in front yeah. of you anyway so a lot of situations like that i've had I mean, obviously that's not about the content of the play but then you're getting notes from the same person on the plane you start going well you don't even know you haven't even gone on wikipedia and when i when i corrected you about i mean honestly i'm not religious so if you came up with any more complex i wouldn't dare to correct anyone but on, i know when the sabbath is if you, when i corrected you on a very basic fact you 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 um you, you contradicted me so really am i going to take your notes then later into the play i find that very, that i find difficult because yeah. um in terms of the structure of the play I was helped a lot in these meetings, but it put me massively on the back foot to start a meeting like that, where I had mm. to sort of justify these basic facts that I felt I didn't, I shouldn't, someone should just go, oh, sorry, I made a mistake, as I would, because I've mm -hmm. made mistakes, of course, for other cultures. Um, and, uh, and, and then this question of, yes, I mean, as a playwright working in a more, I suppose, traditional way than anyone <laughs> than Sudo and Kane I mean I am you know my plays are sort of going through the literary system you know and I don't make my own work um on my uh, you know with my own company um so yes the dramaturgs are usually the gatekeepers and um sometimes that's amazing because you start your conversations on a very creative level about your idea with someone who is really interested in the literary side of what you're doing um but sometimes then you do feel dismayed I think if it's not working out and um I often feel there's a this question of authenticity is very difficult. Um, so the same play that I wrote about Orthodox Jews, um, I was pushed quite hard to have a white person in the play who the people could explain. Um, so people could say things like, oh, and by the way, it's about to be Friday night. So and um, I then I, I put. I put someone in. Um, actually, I, I don't regret that because it was a good character. But and I gave him a massive journey and an arc, and they said, "Oh, he's taken over the play." I said, "Well, I don't think he has. He's got the same." I don't think he did. Um, but I think they just wanted him there just to kind of go. And now is it Friday night? Mm -hmm. And I was like, "I'm not mm -hmm. going to do that. I'm not going to do that. If he's going to ask questions and be there, then he has to have an arc. I'm not having mm -hmm. someone just sit like a tool on stage. Like, there's no. You can't ask an actor to do that as much as anything else. It's embarrassing." Um, and then um, uh, just, just um, there's lots of sort of, um, I suppose, what is authentic? So uh, during the first Iraq war, I was asked for, in for quite a few meetings and I think I could have quite easily got a commission to write a play about the Iraqi Jewish community in relation to that war if they had been anti-war, but mo many, much of the community, I mean, a lot, most of us have changed our minds now and, you know, I was not in favor at the time, but it was, the case that most of my community were pro-war they had suffered under Saddam they wanted him out they felt very on a very personal visceral level that it was on balance a good thing and I said well I can't really write that play that's of them all sitting around the anti-war because I'd have to make it up <laughs> it wouldn't be mm -hmm. authentic mm -hmm. and uh, you know it was a very tricky conversation because I said well what about these other ideas I have that wasn't we didn't that we didn't they didn't want those mm -hmm. um 
and that I kind feel... of speaks into the idea that there's an yes. expectation that that yes. uh, people of the global majority, wherever you're from, that you will write the play that is uh, that is re responding to your um, specific community. I want to just sure. go back to the gatekeeping thing, actually, mm -hmm. because I, I until I read that letter, I had not thought about the dramaturg as the gatekeeper. I think of the gatekeeper as the person who reads the play and decides whether it's going to go on in this venue or not go on in this venue. Right. And that that's for me, that was the point where the gatekeeping happens. Right. That there's an expectation of the kinds of plays that people will write and someone will decide we will put this play on or we won't put this play on. So I just want to tease out a little bit more this idea of the, 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 the dramaturg as a gatekeeper in the way that you're talking about there. You were talking about there came and you spoke and also that you're talking about now, Samantha. Um, um, tell, tell me a little bit more about 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 that, about. I, mean, I know I'd you're giving some examples, of course. Yeah, you're already giving some mean, examples. But let's I'd be very more. interested to hear how um, you know it works at Tamasha because I I haven't uh, you know I've worked mainly with sort of you know the more traditional building where um, yes my first contact as a playwright will normally be the literary manager and the literary manager will be doing a lot of the dramaturgy and I mean I'm often in a situation where I'm having a lovely time with a literary manager dramaturging my play and I love them. And then the artistic director will come in and not like it and mm. either it won't get programmed. And so often the final decision is somewhere else, but right. sometimes mm. I'm in a situation where I'm having an unsatisfactory relationship with literary manager. I think if I just get past you, maybe mm. they could tell me if they like it or not. Uh, so it's, it's gone either way. It's gone either way. And I have had amazing relationships, but yes, I mean, in terms of your first contact and the person you work with most, in my experience, in more traditional buildings, um, that's been the way it's worked for me. Mm. Um, Suda, do you, do you, would you um, like to chime I mean, in? I, for, you know, in terms of Tamasha, I mean, you know, that company came organically from my friendship with Christine London Smith, you know, and we sort of, you know, we wanted to make work for ourselves and then it grew and grew and, you know, eventually, like, it took 10 years for us to say, oh, this is much bigger than us, you know, let's be a full-time company, blah, blah, blah. And so in terms of, for us, you know, there was levels of gatekeeping, you know, people could say we were gatekeepers, you know, because initially we were trying to just, you know, find opportunities for ourselves and then it grew from that. But every time, you know, we nurtured new writers, new writing, you really believed in them, you know, they would come up with the, the play that only they could write, you still had to you still had to find a space to put it on and that's where we often had the you know I can't what are we calling it the patterns of injury you know we had so many patterns of injury and one of them which happened lots of times and you know it would be the mainstream companies you know like the royal court where they might go oh like you found all these writers oh we love that person's voice but that play that you have spent carefully nurturing them for 18 months is not quite what we want you know so why don't you introduce them to us and why don't we take it over because you don't know how to dramaturg i mean i'm being crude but yeah. that happens the <laughs> times you know we'll have the writer thank you you know and that play that they're writing in their authentic voice which has their dialect you know it's got sort of kashmiri punjabi english mm, it's not quite you know it's not, mm. it's not a proper play so that would happen a lot, you know, yeah. um, you and then that. we would sort of go and, you know, luckily sometimes the right you, and you felt like, oh, that writer, do you want to just say, look, please, you know, go to the Royal Court or go to mm. you know, wherever mm. and, and leave us out of it or mm. actually let's help you because you're already vulnerable. You know, let's mm. put on your first play because mm. that's going to be a more sort of. Um, satisfying experience, you know. Thank, thank you for that, because that actually leads nicely into my next discussion point that I've got, because um, it's around this question of dual audiences, and of course, like, so that writer might may well want to, you know, people want to get their play on at the Royal Court, you know, they want people aspire towards that venue, not everybody, but people aspire towards that, towards that venue, and um, I remember, I think it was when I was doing uh, uh, one of my recent books, I, I came across an article by Paul Gilroy where he was talking about uh, you know black writers who aspire to having their plays put on in the mainstream have to learn how to appeal to dual audiences so they have to learn how to appeal to the let's say predominantly white audience 
of a venue like the Royal Court or mainstream venue, while also doing the job of bringing in the new black audiences and appealing to those audiences as well. So I was very struck uh, by the open letter kind of talking about this question of um, plays needing to appeal to dual audiences. And I guess I'm wondering about what the dramaturg um, can do or not do, really not do, in order to, to help the, uh, the plays or the performances um, to, to have this dual appeal. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you have any thoughts. Kane, you've been... Yeah, I think I was in... Um, I think it's about asking the right questions, is it, as a drama mm. too, to be thinking, and even that question, who, who is the audience for this? It's like, mm. often doesn't get asked. It's often like we've already started to work on the piece or we start to restructure and you're like, oh, wait, one of the fundamental questions of who is this for is being missed. Like I was thinking recently and um, the, the tragedy of George Floyd, what happened, that video became a performance. And it's like, who needs to see that video? Because none of my black friends, none of the, like we didn't need to see that, this trauma. It was for maybe there are other audiences who did need to see that. And that's how I was trying to talk about work. But to just assume work is for everybody is not the right thing. Actually, we, we make different choices. I make different choices if I'm making a children's show to if I'm making another show. Mm -hmm. Like I really curate and direct it in a very different way. And it's the same with our audiences. So I don't think it's wrong for us or it shouldn't be a scary question to think, who is the audience? Who do I mm -hmm. want to bring in here? And that's where it's so frustrating when it's like you get these people with louder voices and they take up space writing reviews for big publications and you go, but you weren't my audience. Mm. You weren't the person that this was intended to, but you've got this platform that speaks to a much larger audience. Mm. Um, when, we, when we were making our first show, um, and it was quite tricky for us to get a space for it that we performed in the Vault Festival um, in London. It was like you kind of hire that venue for a week and you perform it there. And I was, it was hard at first, but I was, it was a gift in the end because it made me think we would do this in the middle of Hyde Park and people would come and make a circle around us and come and watch the performance. But it meant that we got to make the art that we, that we wanted. Um, and that we weren't necessarily shape-shifting from the beginning to try and occupy a space that performed to an audience that was of somebody else's venue. Mm. Uh, that's so, so important. I hadn't thought about that, like, because I think there's a thing where there's an assumed sense of who the audience is for X venue or Y venue, and that's maybe how then the, the, the dramaturg um, tries to work with the writer to, to develop the work without saying, well, actually, yeah, who are you writing for? It's a really important point to uh, reiterate. Um, Samantha, I realise I cut you. Oh, I, I, um, I had a wonderful experience a few years ago. I was writing a, um, a children's play about an Iraqi girl who wants to go back to Iraq and can't want to go to her mother's country and eventually went on the polka but this workshop was with a Birmingham rep and they just took me to a primary school um in Birmingham and there was um a, a, about 60 kids it's quite daunting um and uh, and it was we did this amazing exercise where I said okay what are your assumptions about Iraq what are your assumptions about things like flying carpets I had various things I wanted to put in the show some were sort of you know fantasy some were real and um and I wrote them all down. And it was so interesting because you never get to ask. And if I asked an adult, they might think, oh, I can't say. Because that one kid was going, dust. That's my, so I was like, okay. Because I, you know, an adult wouldn't say that, but I knew I was going to be having an audience of six and seven year olds. So it's useful to know that they think it's going to be dusty. Either I can make it dusty, I can not make it dusty, I can do something with the dust. You know, it, it was so useful. And they were, they were, you know, they were absolutely forthright. And I thought, oh my God, imagine if you could do that with adults, but we, you know, people are too polite, it's tricky. Um, and it was just a really interesting, because then I, the whole show, we had those notes, we had the notes on the board in rehearsal. I mean, it was amazing, it was so useful. We played to and against these, you know, these um, cliches, stereotypes, assumptions all the way through. And it was so much fun. And it was so easy because kids were so, open to having their minds changed as well um and, and some of the conversations afterwards were phenomenal um but yeah i mean another thing on this question of who is it for is i often feel like um i've been asked and will you be able to get an audience in from your community and mm -hmm. i often think well i'm not the marketing person and maybe i won't um 
but maybe I don't have to, you know, maybe it will be an audience of lots of different people. Maybe it will be a very diverse audience. Um, I love going to see a play about a culture that isn't my own because you feel like you've been invited to someone's house. You might not know anyone from hmm. Sri Lanka. You go and see a Sri Lankan play and you feel like you've like suddenly like been able to go behind the curtain and you can see, and it's an amazing thing, you know, and I feel like, you know, that I don't mind if people don't, if people don't get everything, if they don't understand every single word, if I use a word in Arabic or I use a word in Yiddish, fine, fine, they can have, they'll get the sense of it, won't they? I mean, they'll, you know, I feel like I, I, I don't like to think of, yes, maybe sometimes you'll have jokes that will land. You can sometimes hear a laugh in one half of the audience and not the other. That's mm. okay. I think that's okay. I mean, yeah. I might, you might find things funny that someone else in this room doesn't. That's okay. Um, it might not be cultural. It might just be because you find that funny. I, but it's sometimes it is cultural, and I think that's all right. I, I, I think that I don't think everyone has to laugh at every line if it's mm. supposed to be a funny line. You know, um, I try. So I, I don't know. I try and kind of free myself a bit from this idea that I have to either attract just one audience and get everything right for them, or be everything for everyone. Like mm. it can be mm. a bit in the middle. I think it was, was it Debbie Tucker Green or someone years ago kind of responding to this kind of question of, you know, well, are there, are there going to be enough black people, for example, to come and see the show? And I think, I think pretty sure it was Debbie Tucker Green who says, if the marketing do their job well enough, then there will be. It could be her, it could be Winston Pinnock. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Somebody said that and it was like, yeah. yeah. And also in terms of going to a show and not getting it all, I, I went to see... Um, Depot Agbolaje's uh, Eaile, the first wife, and there were jokes. There was it was very much um, based within Yoruba culture, in Nigeria. Mm. It's a culture that, as a British Caribbean person, I don't know that culture. And so the audience who and some of the jokes were in um, is it Yoruba as well, and the audience then would get the joke and then it would ripple, and I'd almost be checking with the person mm. next to me. There were some jokes that I got because they were in jokes. For black British, black people, yeah. so you kind of recognise that as a black person. But some were very much, I didn't get them. That was yeah. okay. I get them by the person next to me that, that gets them. So, but um, I think that it, the wider question on um, the marketing person bringing in the audience, it's much broader than that. It's like, but is your venue accessible? Let's talk yeah. about the structures within your venue for why these people mm. don't come here. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? It's not just put the show on and we'll come. Yeah. doesn't necessarily work like that. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, I, I, everything I've done, you, the audiences are, you, ha, you know, you're trying to get constituency audiences mm. who are reflected in the work that you, you know. Um, and, you know, one of the things we've had to kind of deal with so much over the years was, you know, in the early years of Tamasha was, oh, you know, um, the work speaks, you know, white, writers can say my work speaks you know I don't have to think about my audience I mean I was always amazed that as actually really well-known playwrights they never think about who it's for but yeah. they never have to you know and and that that becomes one of those things of you know who's benchmark because yeah. your your work obviously doesn't speak because you're only speaking to your tribes mm. you know literally had people who are you know who are actually people I would consider as allies you know, once been, in fact, it was about my Lorca adaptation, the house of Bilkis Bibi, which was the house of Banada Alba transposed to Pakistan. And, you know, I had a little bit of Punjabi in it. And, it, and if you were open, it was literally, you know, the servant is cussing the beggar in Punjabi. Like you're not, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, um, disengage white audiences, but I had to go on Radio 4 and I was on the back foot to try and explain why my work was not indecipherable because it had a bit of Punjabi in it, you know. And wow. I mean, literally this, this kind of trope of if your, work, if your work will transcend and endure because it will speak, you know. Well, it's taken me a long time, you know, to have that confidence to know my work speaks. You know, mm. if it doesn't speak to you, it's because you haven't lent in and opened your ears, you know. Exactly, because yeah. you're not listening or, or yeah, yeah let, letting it, allowing it in. Um, thank you, this is all moving quite nicely. So I have, I have two things. One thing is around universality, but this might, that might build into actually the next um, area actually that um, I have, it's not quite formulated, but I'm gonna jump ahead and maybe we'll come back to this question of universality because it's, it's a, 
it's a slight bugbear in my mind sometimes when a when a black playwright, for example, says, "Well, my play's universal," and I get, I sometimes I think, does it have to be? Um, what what is what what are you doing by trying to assert that? And I want to tie that in somehow, as, as Sudas just mentioned, um, adaptation. And uh, as I said before, we we went live. I was a big fan of um, Tamasha. Yes, I used to do Strictly Dandia as well. I used to, <laughs> saw that as well. <laughs> and I saw Ghost Dancing, which was adapted from Therese McCann, mm -hmm. and A Yearning, which was adapted from Yerma, yeah. Wuthering Heights, The House of Bilkis BB. And then, of course, there were the adaptations from like A Fine Balance, um, uh, for example, that's adapted from. Um, is right. Indian, Indian work already. So you've got the kind of the adaptations of European plays, but also the, adap the adaptations from Indian plays. And in the open letter, oh yeah, 14 songs, two weddings and a funeral from the, <laughs> I used to teach my students that the Bollywood film, which had no English in it at all, but they had to watch it. And then the the, the adaptation I against it, which was in English. I didn't even know this was happening. Yeah. I'm so delighted <laughs> yes. to hear this. <laughs> so I, 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 I love that work. So in the open letter, I was quite pleased that it sort of talks about adaptations and critics of adaptations and how we kind of, what the, who, who are the, so you say we're going to adapt something from an Indian novel, but a white critic is then going to be the person mm -hmm. that judges um, its value. I just wonder if you want to just open up a little bit on this question of, adaptation for us as Suda? Yes, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you've sort of listed the kind of range of adaptations in a way that, you know, I've been involved with, you know, and I think for us, it, it was always, it's always an artistic impulse, you know, that makes mm. you want to do something. So it's not like you're cynically trying to say, oh, this will be great for audiences. You know, you it, first of all, you know, you love the book and then you know that it will make a really good stage play and then you know mm. that you know, as I said, you know, audience development, you know, my sister Suman, you know, we, we have just always, it's always hand in hand, you mm. know, so that's always been the case. But, you know, this thing in the letter about, um, you know, don't always assume that people of colour want to place adaptations in the countries other, that are there, supposedly, you know, countries of origin, you know, but I can also say the converse is that when they do want to do that, you know, like, let them, let, you know, don't try to be a barrier either. So I think mm -hmm. it has to come from your artistic impulse. You know, when I went, I'm, I'm married to a Pakistani and, you know, I've been to Pakistan a few times. And when I travel to a small town, there's a small town called Jang in Punjab, you know, where the, the, the love, the sort of Romeo and Juliet story, the Punjabi story of Heer Ranja. So the, the, the tragic heroine Heer, her, her sort of, mausoleum is there you know and people go to sort of you know pray for their wishes to come true and i i sort of thought of Lorca's play mm. set there because i also noticed about you know through through immigration how there were a lot of single girls in families who were waiting for you know brothers and the men who were abroad to find matches for them and and actually they they didn't have that agency you know and somehow that play and that setting it just spoke to me you know um, and that's how it started mm. but it, it's very problematic you know because you do have you really do have so-called white experts saying you know who are you to do Lorca that isn't Lorca you know and then how do you you know you've got to navigate all that and yet our Indian audiences Pakistani audiences came and for mm. them it was like a new play set in Pakistan mm. they didn't have to know you know, Lorca. Yeah. There's also something about choice, isn't there? So again, this is just from the research that I did before and from how I used to teach the play. So I used to kind of teach on the one hand, say, Jatinder Verma's approach and all the work that he did around kind of English theatre and how we might remake classics with a particular kind of British, English, Asian, Caribbean kind of fusion. Exactly. And also then I think it's Yvonne Brewster from Talamar at the time kind of said, actually, if I do an adaptation of Shakespeare, I'm from Jamaica, which was a, a colony, a British colony. I grew up with Shakespeare. I have the right to do it straight. I don't need to have to adapt it. I need to have the choice to do it as yeah. I want to do it rather than there being an expectation that I'm going to adapt it. Because actually, after all, I was educated in your, in your colony. <laughs> Well, By the I, way, so, I, yeah. I, I think there is an expectation all the time, you know, Samantha, you were saying about, you know, 
from you know will your communities come well i'm i've always had like as to Marsha, it's like oh let's book them because they will come with mm. Mm. but then that mm. is that is quite a thing to carry because if they don't then so you know mm -hmm. you not naively but you know i did think oh the local lovers will come yes and we um, are working really hard to get but actually you know again you know two sort of lukewarm reviews by white critics who said this isn't Lorca mm -hmm. and that audience is gone and but actually then you have a huge audience from your own backyard but it's as if <laughs> it didn't happen in the theater you know mm -hmm. yeah. great mm -hmm. and um just on that just want to try and tie in the universality and I'm going to come to you Kane because when I sort of said universality even though I hadn't mm. really formed anything you sort of went oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, were you, what was in that huh? I, think maybe, <laughs> I guess I'd ask what do you mean by universality or mm. um, I, the way I understood it was maybe something around um, appealing to everybody Mm -hmm. um, which made me think that therefore my job is to make my work clear and appear to everyone. And actually, I'm not quite sure. I do think that. I think I'm, I often want to divide the audience or I actually <laughs> want everybody to leave feeling different things or I want to sit in the complications or the difficulty that I love when like four people laugh in the audience and nobody else does and it's complex and we go, oh, what does that mean? And so this idea of um, it, like, we're not trying to just make entertaining work, you know what I mean? I want to reflect back the mm. complex world we live in. I want to mm. present relationships that are difficult. Mm. Um, but I think it's that, that's the thing. So I think from my, my sense of it is that people say, well, you know, you might read my play through uh, the relationships that are difficult and think about that in a political way, or you might just go, actually, it's a difficult relationship between a, a father and their, their, their child mm -hmm. or a mother and their child mm -hmm. or a brother and a sister. And mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the looking at it in terms of the, the brother and the sister, the father and the child, the father and the child, mm -hmm. the mother and the child, the parent and the child, that that's the kind of universal, mm -hmm. universal, whereas the kind of specifics is, well, mm -hmm. it's about a father and a, a parent and a child and the issue of X, whatever mm -hmm. that, that issue might be. And, and that the playwrights would say, well, although we've got these issues, some of the playwrights, although we've got these issues in our plays, actually, they're about parents and their, yeah. and, and their, and their children and the parents wanting the best for their children and, and everyone can tune into that. And so that means that they're universal. Mm. Whereas I was always like, yeah, but they're also specific. Yeah, very because specific. they're about a black parent and their black child, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Samantha? Um, I was gonna say, um, I think, um, there's this pressure on particular characters as well like I mean I've never written almost never written a Jewish character without being asked why why do they have to be Jewish yeah. well why not and and I think that assumption is that the default is white and probably C of E and maybe male I don't know um whereas for me the easiest character for me to write is an Iraqi Jewish woman uh, obviously I'm not going to write every single play with that um, I would say when I write anyone, they're going to be infused with my sensibility. Um, and so I wrote a play about wolves in Scotland, wolves being returned to Scotland. And I thought this is the one where I'm just literally not putting myself in at all. There's not going to be any of me in it. <laughs> and a friend of mine read it and was just like, OK, this is the bit that's about rock. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah I'm busted. But I mean, you know, you didn't need to know that. You know, you didn't need to know that if you saw the play. Um, so I think I, what I'm saying is, Every play I write is a rocket Jewish, but if I happen to write, if I think that, if I think that the best way of getting across this story and the person who's the story who, who I want to tell is a Jewish woman or an Iraqi woman or someone who is Iraqi Jewish, I, I think there's no there's no way I could suddenly kind of make them a different ethnicity just because. And um, I find this question very difficult, you know, I, I to answer in a because when you if you say to someone that suggests that you think the default is a white is a white person. That's mm. a very aggressive way of starting the conversation. But I've never found a good way of having the conversation. I always just go, well, why not? And sometimes mm. I go, well, I find it easier to write these people, which I think makes me look like I can't write anyone else, which, you know, <laughs> like arguably is true. But I don't want to. Why should I have to be 
you know doing myself down here in these conversations so i found it difficult but also i so agree with what you've both been saying about all been saying about um specificity because actually i think the more specific um yeah. someone is um about their own experience actually the more weirdly the more it lets you in you know and I think it's the same in memoir you know those very specific memoirs where you think well I'm not going to be able to read this I've not been an alcoholic and lived you know on Orkney and had a farm oh actually I feel like I've got more out of this book than I had about the one that was from some written by someone in my community you know because something mm. about it spoke to me and I think if you if you sort of make it if you know if you try and make it universal you end up writing these yeah. bland nothingy yeah. characters yeah. and i have been there i've been there where i've taken the specifics out it's just they've just become so boring mm -hmm. um and this you know the specifics don't have to be personal to the writer or the maker the theater maker but i think they have to be specific in some way mm -hmm. you know whether you give someone a love of chess or a, a fondness for cheese or whatever the happens to be it doesn't have to be ethnicity but it does have to be there i think and the mm. minute you sort of go oh they just like all foods just go well that's not a character is it so mm. i don't know why you would do that in terms of culture and ethnicity why you would sort of go it's fine for them to just go i just like everything i'm just like every you know i'm just universal mm. Mm. I, you thank know. you for that that again chimes in quite nicely with the kind of i guess the last point that i've got to that i wanted to kind of bring up and before just inviting you all to to to, to, to have a response and it goes back again to this thing of the best possible play which kept coming up over and over again and and somewhere in the letter it kind of talks about well actually as a dramaturg one of the things that you must do is that you must trust the person of the global majority to to know what, what the limits are for how they want to write their play right because mm. it, it, it's I think there was something where it says uh, don't be reverential so if we want to send up our communities, then we want to be able to do that. And you, 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 we don't want you as a person who's not of those communities potentially to be pulling us back from that if it's something that, that, that we want to do. And I guess, um, yeah, trust us as writers that we know what we're doing. And I guess if we're going to say that, what does that mean for the role of the, 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 the dramaturg then? Because mm. in a way it would be like, well, I'll just do what I want and what, what what role would the dramaturg have? What would be their? How would we see their role or perceive their role? Mm. To 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 kind of, I guess, give enough space for us to do what we want, but also still doing their role of of dramaturging. Um, what's being requested, I guess, when we're when we're saying trust us. Um, mm. I think um, you know, I think the from. From sort of, you know, when I, as I say, you know, mostly I've dramaturg young writers who are writing their debut play. And they've been sort of writers of color, you know. And essentially, the thing I keep coming across is people having this default position because they think they need to, of leaving themselves, aspects of themselves outside the door because they think it won't be they won't be able to translate it to a bigger universal audience so my job has always been to sort of say you know write the play and and I this is not you know one of the wonderful dramaturg Lynn Coughlin and Philip Osmond that I've worked with you know one of the things that I've taken away is that you know write the play or the piece of theater which might not be a you know play um, that only you can do you know, that you've brought your full self to, that you can hand on heart, look at that and go, actually, no one else could have done that because that is me. You know, and that doesn't mean that you've you've kind of made yourself vulnerable and scavenged yourself and, you know, wrung yourself dry on stage, but it does mean that you've brought your full self. And what I find is that's been my job. And a lot of it is is actually, you know, it's like a pastoral job as well. It's not just... Mm you come there or you're going to be there for six weeks to dramaturg your play. I mean, I have worked with writers over six years, you know. Um, so Tien Do, who wrote her first play, Summer Rolls, you know, she first came to a Tamasha acting workshop, writing workshop. And actually what she was encouraged to do in drama school is to, is to wipe, to kind of keep her Vietnamese side outside the door. Mm. And actually mm. to my job was really to to bring that right in and if you're going yeah. to write about that you know community and and actually there's a vulnerability 
you know, and I, and I feel that myself, you know, I go through, I give advice to people that I can't take myself, that I always feel, <laughs> you know, feel my well, because a lot of it is to do with, we are standing there, such a vulnerable place because you're trying to write something really personal, you feel the responsibility of the communities, mm. you have language, you know, that's the other big thing. You're writing characters who, who are, who don't speak English. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to write them in English, how do you do that? You know, mm -hmm. and so I think my job has been very much like really, really holding the hands and pastoral, as well as being the person who questions, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the practice, mm -hmm. you know, is the story coming through, you know, right. where's yeah. dramatic arcs, you know, what language are you going to, you know, all of that. Yeah, I think that's. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting though because it's this idea of the, the, the kind of craft. So yeah, the question of craft. I think right. I guess you're, you're speaking about, but also the questions mm. of the, the kind of content in terms of maybe the politics or the narrative or something else. What that's just that's and also separate craft to is, the craft. You know, um, and also what I wanted to say was that we're not we're not divorced from mm. a centric, you know, toolbox as it were. Mm. So yeah. the question of what you want to take, what serves mm. you, what doesn't, you know. Mm. Yeah, I really agree with that idea of the pastoral role it is and the idea of holding the hand of people. It's like, I'm working with, like we're going into a relationship, like if yeah. we're gonna work together and, um, and it's delicate and fragile and bold and stern. It's like, it has all of that, but we kind of have to set it up in the right way. Um, and I think I'm often, asking what are you trying to say mm. um, and then I can reflect on thinking is that coming through it might not be to me it might be to other people but I'm really curious about what do you have to say and what are you trying to say and then mm. I'm also wanting to know why now like yes. why now why why now we mm. like why are you making this work now and yeah. often that's a deeply personal and it might not appear in any way in the performance but it's mm. fueling the making in some mm. way to know why I'm making this work. Mm. And I think when we answer that question, it gives such a focus to, yeah. to mm. the direction we're going in. That's wonderful, what's driving you. Mm. Um, so just, are you, are you gonna speak? Because otherwise I'll just no, jump no, on a little, I'm gonna move on a little bit, because this I'm just quite aware of time as well. <laughs> uh, just to kind of um, have a moment really to, to, to think about um, change and this question of change. And there were a few things in, in the letter. So one thing was um, for, Eurocentric, for Eurocentric dramaturgy to change, everything has changed. Inclusion must happen everywhere. So I'm interested in kind of what might what might we need what needs to happen there. Whether there are some ideas, and there are a couple of things that are list, that are mentioned in the letter. One is in the response to the open letter, where um, the dramaturgs network talks about you know we want to be good allies. So allies as a as a as a response. Um, and the other was kind of in recognizing that that European or Eurocentric dramaturgy is not, it's just one model. It's what Kane was talking about right at the beginning, right? With your grand your grandmother, I think you were saying, the, the, the house, the archives, yeah. the stories, yeah. the way that, that she tells stories, right? Uh, and so the Eurocentric model is one model, but there are other models. And I just wonder whether you've got any thoughts there about um or ideas about what needs to change so that we can log those in this in this uh, recording that we're making specific things couple of things um i i think i'm actually just picking up on what you guys were both saying about trust i think mm. i think um that i think the relationship being delicate um when i've i was going to say another sorry another thing that um as a playwright i've had a lot of dramaturgy from directors and that's often where it happens and from actors as well and so in the room you know when the work's actually being made i should say that it's not just purely with dramaturgs and literary managers of course and um and um i think if there is going to be change i think i think often as a playwright you feel like you um have to please the person you're with you have to um you know you're you, I mean, I think some of this is reflected in the structures, for example, in rehearsal, when you may, might be doing major rewrites, you might be doing your biggest rewrite yet in rehearsal. Um, you're paid an attendance fee as though you're just sitting there attending, as though you're an audience yeah. member to the rehearsal. Um, and I don't say this because I want more money, particularly. I'm just saying it in terms of like, let's not call it that. Mm -hmm. Let's say that the person, if you, I mean, you may not be touching it, you may, you may have 
dotted every i and it's all done but actually i've never been in a rehearsal room where i haven't been going okay let's do something massive here you know as a result of the brilliant questions i'm getting asked the pro provocation watching the actors work you know it's a very very important time in my process and that you know and i'm going home at nights and i'm rewriting and i'm bringing stuff in and i'm on the phone to the director and it's you know it's a huge thing for me that's probably the busiest time of my every whenever i have a play on and yeah i just think if we if we're going to be constantly feeling like we're not really there we're just watching um like we have to please people to get to the next stage uh, i i don't think any change is going to happen then because you you have to be very bold to fight against that and i haven't been and i and i know younger playwrights much less bold than me you know when i was starting out as well and i you know you want to say to them you know you've got to fight that but actually that doesn't always work sometimes it means you don't get the commission or people don't want to work with you so i don't know there has to be a sort of i don't there's uh, it's something to do with the status of the if you are working with writers the status of the writer in these conversations um and i'm sorry one last thing is i think you have to have the freedom to be stupid i just kind of feel yeah. like there was a point in theatre where I felt if I said, I'm really sorry, I don't understand any of this, because you just, sorry, I don't understand what you said, could you explain to me? Like, you couldn't say that. People would just go, oh, she's an idiot, we're not going to work with her. <laughs> Actually, sometimes it's very useful to say, to, to ask the stupid question, you know, sometimes you need to ask the stupid question. Um, and so, I don't know, I feel like often I'm in a position where I both have to, like, please and, you know, help, you know, do, do everything right, and also can't, can't say i really don't understand what you said i re you know let's can you rephrase it for me can you help me uh, actually so i so i can't ask for help either and um, so if i want help i can't get it you know there's something about that relationship that just in those individuals individual relationships that i think you know and i and when i have worked with people who are great Oh my god, it's great! It is like as Kane says, like a good relationship. You just feel yeah. like oh, here I am. It's like going around to dinner at your best friends. You know where the wine yeah. is. You know where the corkscrew is. You can relax. You know they're not going to laugh at you if you say something stupid, but they might laugh at you. If you say other things, and that's fine. You can laugh at them, mm. and then you can make really good work. And I yeah. just feel like, obviously, that's hard to make, and it's not all on the director or the dramaturg to set that up. The writer has to bring something to the table, but. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, when I've been feeling like I'm sitting at the back of a rehearsal room making my notes and not not part of it, that's not made for a good yeah, situation. And so there's a few workshops. things there. Great. Freedom. Sorry, too much. <laughs> no, not at all. Freedom. I've got a bad habit of not knowing when people are stopping, so I go <laughs> straight yeah. So freedom, <laughs> trust, um, the idea of co-creation. So that comes back to something that was already said earlier, kind of co-creating the work again like you're saying working with the the, the playwright the oh yeah the recognizing the playwright is active in the rehearsal room mm. that's something really important uh, working with the playwright with the director but also with the, the people the actors mm. the people that are performing the show um Kane so do you have any uh, ideas I love change change, change yeah. is so important <laughs> it's like every time we do one of our shows or bring it back it's like We've got to change it all. It has to change because the world's changed. We're six months later. Everything's adaptive. Mm -hmm. Like, how are we going to make it relevant now? Mm -hmm. How is it relevant in this space in comparison to that space? We've changed cast. It, like, we've changed identities. How are we going to do that now? Putting this body there instead of that one tells a totally different meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm so open to change. I might hate it. And wrestle with it at times i'd be like i need to go and have a walk around the car park because this is really difficult <laughs> but i really embrace it and i think it's necessary because mm. like how are we going to make a better future if we stick with the same it's like we have to in our rooms in as small ways we can try to embrace the change mm. right i think it's all i mean what i've um also you know because i've literally almost you know always had to produce my own work um, you know, whether at Tamasha or, you know, now at Butcher Boulevard. So I guess that's the kind of lived experience that I kind of encourage as well. So for younger writers, you know, well, actually, you know, Nyla Levy, who did, does my Bond book, looks big in this, and Tiendo, you know, with summer roles, but the, the most recent people I've dramaturged. Um, you know, they, they applied, you know, they applied for Arts Council funding with my, you know, I helped mentor that you know like okay let's 
don't wait for you know the building to commission you or the company to commission you because it might not happen you know um so curate your own voice so you know just encouraging people to be um yes to see their work in, in terms of content and context because mm. actually that's that's the way forward because you know if you if you want more agency in a sense you have to have it you know yeah. well i mean i've never had it given to me you know mm. it has to be something that you your your sort of shaping yourself um so right I thank you for change in terms of change you know thank you thank you all for this for this discussion um we're get, starting to get questions through in the chat so i think i'll start to invite you to respond to some of those questions and then hopefully in about 15 minutes time there'll just be a time for a few final comments if, if you have any um so we've got a question from holly um and it says um are there any aspects of creating performance which can which can be universalized uh can we all agree on clarity of intention as being important for the for the best version of the play for example um, so I'll read it again. Are there any aspects of creating performance which can be universalized? Would we all agree on the clarity of intention as being important to create the best version of a play, for example? Um, can I ask clarity of intention when? I mean, when you when the play opens, yes, it's you know, I think it's quite good to be clear then. But what I struggle with is, you know, I go in with a weird idea that I'm going to jam onto another weird idea and it may not work and I want to be able to be unclear and mess about and fail um but sometimes if I'm writing a play about my um you know my um co community that I know better than the dramaturg perhaps they're like but is this correct is yeah. this authentic and I'm like well I, I mean this isn't how it's going to end up but this is where I'm starting um so I think we need the freedom maybe to be unclear at the beginning. Mm. I think and not have to be sorry, right on those questions sorry. from the beginning. Sorry, Kane. No, so sorry, interrupted you. Um, I think I want there to be a space of big feelings. I want to go to the theatre and feel in the audience. Like so I also like often I leave feeling sometimes not much. And I'm like, oh, so I'd say for me, one of the things in performance that I'd be looking for is trying to at least create feelings in the audience, big feelings somehow. Mm. Um, I mean, it is hard to sort of be prescriptive, isn't it? In terms of, you know, have a manifesto of, you know, mm. what is performance and what we all agree is a universal way of, you know, making performance because I, I would go back to, you know, be, be bring your full selves. As yeah. long as the person is bring, you know, I mean, I'm now from, you know, I'm now doing like a one woman monologue, which I've been developing for, you know, more than two years, which is inspired by my conversations with my sons. Mm -hmm. And it's called Evening Conversations, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not a play. And it, it's me, you know, talking to my sons, playing my sons, Every time I do it, I I, ha I do have to change it because, you know, as you say, you know, okay, the world has changed since the last time I did it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did it like a week before lockdown and then the, it, it wasn't until, you know, this summer that I did it again. So I have to think about my conversations with my sons in the context of lockdown, you know. Mm -hmm. But what it was still a performance, you know. Yeah, I think that like for me, that's why performance is special because performance has existed always whether it has been like i said earlier sitting around the table telling stories or whether it's been performing on a massive stage it's like it, it exists in all cultures it's like often theater is quite um, centralized and has a more narrow way of viewing what it could be but performance has always been there just coming back to this question the idea of creating performance i think i've been in many rooms which might lead on to another question around bad practice you know what i mean mm. where we've seen it done badly the creating is not done um, wholeheartedly, holistically. We haven't embraced, like, it's felt hierarchical. It's like, I've seen much bad practice. So I'd say to at least choose some values in the creating stage that mm. are kind, um, involve listening, that mm. um, embrace the outside world and can't just be this into, like, um, mm. I'd say in the creating, I'd like some of those values to be universalized. Mm. 
that also goes back to the idea of there being different models of different ways of creating performance and that we you know we don't all have to do it the, the same way which is you know the, the trained way let's mm. say you know mm. let's let, allow space for people to find their way i suppose as well so um so there's a question from sarah in the chat which is about allies so returning us back to this thing around allies um and sarah's asking what can dramaturgs do to be an ally to, to artists of the global majority in both institutional and freelance contexts um yeah what can dramaturgs do to, to good allies because that, that was definitely one thing that was in the response was we want to be good allies and now it's inviting us to say well what might that mean um from a from the perspective of people who are making performance or working as dramaturgs uh, i think from the outset you know um when i think about you know what i've I've been through both as an artist myself, mm. who's written the work and trying to be an ally, you know. Mm. Um, I think interrogating somebody's work from a Eurocent, from your own perspective, when you haven't been reflexive about where you're coming from. Mm. I, think that's what, I mean, I have so often been on the back foot, you know. Um, like one of the things I wrote, which was called um, My Name Is, you know, based on a true story, you know, from testimonies, which was very delicate. You know, I won't sort of, it'll take forever to describe it all. But, you know, the, the journey to that took six years because of this constant, like, you know, I had testimony and I was ostensibly sending to it to receptive people who kept saying, we're so receptive to unfinished work. You know, we, we're so receptive to this story. And then criticizing it for it not being. And then saying, we love verbatim, but actually, oh, it's verbatim and we don't want to do verbatim, you know. So I think in a way, yeah, just being open to where, where have you come from? You know, what, what do you bring into the room? And so mm -hmm. not interrogating the, the writers to a point where they lose confidence in what they're doing, mm. but to understand from their point of view what they're trying to do, mm. whether they want to include language, is it mm. in a form, what are they doing? And they're, therefore supporting them mm. you know, mm. the best way that you can. Yeah, there was something in the letter as well about, um, you know, if you don't know, like be, be know what, what you don't know, and and then maybe bring someone in who does know. I don't know, mm. they didn't quite put it like that, but like, you know, maybe you might need some help from someone who might, know a little bit different yeah. different stuff to what you know um and, and maybe just being aware of, of that so yeah i think um, i agree yeah. i come from that probably psychotherapeutic approach of like the more i understand myself the safer i am for being in the world mm. um, and i really believe that like so know where my limitations are my mm. boundaries where my unconscious bias is it's like can where i'll trip myself up or can start to make me think, am I the right person for this? Mm, and I think mm. we have to always be aware of power. Who has the power here? Mm, and if, mm. if we're walking into a big institution and you're a drama tech in that space, it's like to know that it's not an equal relationship and what could you do to take yourself off the pedestal almost and make yeah. sure that you're listening as much as offering. Yeah, wonderful. Goes back yes. to your Friday night person, doesn't it? Yeah. Your Friday night, Saturday person. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, well, I think I think it's really nice if you. I, I I I'm sort of echoing what everyone else is saying, but I think um, I I like to work with someone who is another person rather than someone who is like the decider and who is the person who's telling me, oh, this is wrong in craft terms, or you can't do X, or you can't do Y. Coming from, like it's really nice when a dramaturg will say. Okay, so this is my cult cultural background, and this is why I'm finding this bit tricky to get. Yeah. And, you know, they can be vulnerable too, because as a writer, mm -hmm. you are so vulnerable, especially if it's personal. I mean, especially when I've done stuff that's based on my own family and my own work. Uh, it's so, t I mean, it's very difficult sending an email where you've written attaching a play in which you've talked about family experiences, for example, or community mm -hmm. experiences that you that you may not have been able to really talk about to anyone. And because it's work in progress, and you're in a, you know, you send it to a dramaturg. And if you feel like they are sort of this sort of authority figure who has never kind of, you know, shared any vulnerability. I'm not saying you have to share all your vulnerability all day, but, you know, who's just been this sort of authority figure. It's very frightening. I find it very, you know, then you feel very sort of 
skin you know skinless in a way um and i yeah. also think you know you have to be thin skinned to make good work so yeah. if you're going to ask someone to sort of peel themselves <laughs> you don't have to be a bit a bit unpeeled yourself you're a bit gentle yeah, you know as cuts as go like it goes both ways i think the writer yeah. has to also allow the dramaturg to make mistakes that's fine too but yeah. that's not often how it feels in the room you know yeah. So it's and person as well as role, isn't it? Mm. You're a person yes. as well as a yes. as well as a, 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 a role that you're yeah. that you're in. And yeah, sorry, Sudar. No, I mean, in fact, uh, I'm sort of you know um, mentoring a, a young writer at the moment, and actually, like, she's really, really keen on starting with form, you know, experimenting mm. with form. And you know, I had to be really like honest and say that I've always, the way I make work, I always start with, you know, the content and the voice. And I, I don't have that. I actually don't have that parameters of helping you with like, oh, how do you start with form first? Because that's just not my instinct, you know. Mm -hmm. Actually, my instinct is to say to you, like, bring your full self, because she's also really like wanting to almost disguise herself before she has actually, you know, brought herself do you see what i mean mm -hmm. and actually but then i'm conscious that you know i love the way you said you know to take yourself off the pedestal because mm -hmm. i actually might not be the right person you know because there are people out there who who start with form and they're brilliant at what they do and i'm on i'm not that person you know yeah. but it's also maybe it sounds like you're where you're talking about kind of dramaturgy as conversation you know a conversation between makers right rather than the dramaturgy is a hierarchy and again something that struck me in the open letter and it was something around the best and it talked about the objective best or something and my immediate thing was what objective right yeah. talk, and I'd written objective it's subjective it's, it's <laughs> and I'd added subjective right so maybe there's something there around yeah knowing what your positionality is or the places from which you're speaking and and bringing your positionality together with the, the and experience together with the person that you're you're working with, and and therefore there's a, a conversation to be had rather than a hierarchical thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question, um, and time is going against us. This is this might build from what we were just talking about, and it's a question from Tomo, and it says, um, can we decolonize theatre whilst it remains an extractive capitalist enterprise? Question mark. <laughs> so who, wants to, who wants to take that on first? Go. You My do it. first thing, because this question comes up, or the, the concept of decolonization comes up so much. And I just think we need to stop talking about colonization. What are the colonial practices that we see, the behaviors that we see as colonial that we want mm. to dismantle? But mm. often we kind of jump straight into decolonizing. And I'm like, whoa, let's just actually start to list all of these things that we go, I see this every day happening, and let's now begin to change them. But yeah, yeah. I wanted to throw that mm. in. First. And one of those is objectivity, <laughs> and another is hierarchy <laughs> and power. <laughs> um, anybody else want to come in on, on theatre as a capitalist, uh, an extractive capitalist enterprise? How, how can we dismantle that, I suppose? Can we dismantle that? I mean, I think I always, I mean, I'm sort of, I believe in sort of small cumulative acts that people yes. can make, you know, the change that you can see yourself, you know, doing. Um, I mean, I find quite from, on a personal level, you know, if I think about how I'm going to decolonize theatre, you know, it's just, it seems too huge, you know, but I can look at like theatre doesn't have to be, you know, the well-made British play that people play pay 60 pounds or, or more to go and see and uh, you know I, I have long given up you know I went through my own thing of wanting to be in the mainstream and have been and have not been and I constantly look at you know um, articles about you know people's body of work and I'm never in even in those sort of footnotes and actually you do what you can mm. yourself in spaces that that are open for you and that you open yourself. I mean, that for me is decolonizing, you know, uh, instead mm. of trying to take on the whole big shebang, which I, I can't mm. sort of. Mm. There's a wonderful image that I've kept with me for years and years and years. And I think it was about feminist theater. 
and it was about like when you're in the, if you it was an image of a lawn a perfectly laid lawn and that if you're a feminist you think of yourself as a mole so the perfectly laid lawn just you just pop up and you create so now that perfectly laid lawn more and has a little <laughs> hill and it's just about you just rup, you're just rupturing it and because your, your presence in the room your presence in in the dialogue if you like will just create those little ruptures just to unsettle so it's not about mm -hmm. completely annihilating but just starting to create the rupture so that people have to look differently because you have to look slightly differently when they were or walk differently yeah. move through the lawn differently when there were little hills in it compared to it being mm. perfectly laid so it's quite yeah. a nice image that I've kept um Samantha you come yeah I, I just actually really inspired by that image yeah I mean I think like um you know like I said I have mostly worked in buildings but I've also worked for example with the miniaturists and that was an idea that the playwright Stephen Ooh. Sharkey had he came around to dinner actually and we were all having a big moan there were four playwrights around the table and then he called up and said come to mine because I've got a better idea I've got an idea <laughs> I was like okay and he said let's just put some stuff on yeah. and we won't have to talk to buildings and the idea of that was that the writers would you know assemble the team so you'd actually contact a director you wanted to work with and act and you often would cast it or you know it was the writer would assemble the team so instead of being sort of the person the team was sort of given to um yeah. and I just doing some 15 minute plays with them really revved up my confidence I'm not saying they were particularly good and they might have been you know I might have chosen the wrong director for them but just being able to go okay let's just try working on this one with this person who I really like and see what that does um and the fact of them being 15 minutes long just really that's just, just on my on my you know on my personal level really helped me because um I didn't have to go okay I'm going to completely change the way I write and then send in my new play in you know you know samantha 2.0 send that in to the royal court and see if they take it i just did one over a weekend yeah. and saw what happened and um so yeah I, I i think in terms of making these changes some of it is going to have to be people just doing things and seeing what that does to their own practice and to the theater environment as a whole um mm -hmm. and you know um i mean samasha is a huge brilliant example of that you know sort of landmark example really that um but you know lots of people have done it on small on, you know in, in in much smaller and more short-term ways and I, and I think that's viable too you know people just popping up pop up the idea of pop-up shows yeah. or mm -hmm. pop-up ways of working and short um, plays as well as you're saying they, they can be quite raw right they can be just yeah. responsive or you know it doesn't need maybe all of the dramaturgical input that we that, that maybe people yeah. think we need for the, the two-hour play or whatever it might I be. I think um, so, the writers yeah. you know taking charge I mean I, I belong to a, a writers group called The Plot and you know we are mid-career writers middle-aged mid-career and we meet and we you know we read each other's stuff and dramaturg each other you know mm -hmm. somebody might have written the whole play somebody might be feeling wrong mm -hmm. who done anything and actually, it's a really brilliant sort of place. Mm -hmm. Great. So again, kind of collaboration yeah. coming in there, co-created work. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so we've only we've only got a few minutes left, uh, maybe two or three minutes left, and I just want to just give you each of you a, an opportunity to just say a, a few closing words, um, anything at all that you want to say that comes out of the, the discussion, or any point maybe that hasn't been raised yet that you think actually I just want to make sure that that's heard in this in this discussion just a, a few words sort of you know 30 seconds 40 seconds each or something um samantha you're smiling i'll invite you oh, <laughs> i'm smiling because i'm trying to think what to say um I mean, oh, it's just so nice. no but i just like to say it's really good to actually have the chance to talk about these things and maybe yeah. it would be amazing if a writer dramaturg relationship began with a conversation like this with a dramaturg about what's not what what's worked and what's not worked for you before on both sides you know um and you know what's what's been what's made you anxious what what are you worried about you know what are you excited about you know but for both you know for the dramatists to tell you as well um you know they can say we're really worried you're not going to deliver until the night before and it's going to be a nightmare I mean, that's fine i'd like to that's useful for me to hear that and i can say you know maybe a, and, and this kind of conversation about specifically how it's impacted on on 
you on, on your work in terms of universality in terms of trying to translate to different audiences or across different audiences i'd love to start I'd love to start a working relationship with this kind of conversation. I don't mm. think I ever have. Um, so maybe we start you. too specific. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Sudha? Um, yeah, I think it would be also interesting that if writers, I mean, I, I don't have that much experience of being the writer commissioned by a, you know, mainstream theatre, but if writers are asked, you know, who would be their ideal dramaturg? Like, mm, actually, lovely. you know, whose work do I love and who's, who I would love to... I think that would be quite something, you know, um, as, as a way of starting. But also just, I mean, I am very much for, you know, also making theatre, which isn't necessarily commissioned plays mm. from, from a single voice as well. Right. Yeah. Thank mm. you. Yeah, who do you want to work with? Um, and Kane? Yeah, I think Please. I'm thinking in similar ways, really, like, I always come back to this quote, but I'm asking it in my friendships, really, of like, what does support look like for you? I think it's such yeah. a great question that I'm always going, I want to be supportive and what do you need? Like, yeah. that helps me. Also, I really run with the one that is, the story I'm making up in my head is this. <laughs> and it means that I own my own uh, rubbish sometimes, or <laughs> I realise what I'm bringing to it. Um, I think I'm really, it, when, I, when I work as a movement director or a choreographer now, I'm so not talking about the content of the work, but I'm talking about who we are as people. And to go, before I can even say if we'll work together, it's like, I want to know what you stand for and why you're making it and what your values are and all of this stuff. And I think yeah. the working world could embrace that a little bit better rather than it just being about the content of the play. Because we're going to yeah. be in relationship for like potentially three months or three years making something together. Mm. Yeah, great. Or six years, I think, was mentioned earlier <laughs> as well. So thank you so much all, to all of you for this uh, discussion. You. It's it. I've really um, enjoyed. I never thought that much in my work about dramaturgy before. I mean, I look at kind of finished plays and I analyse finished finished plays. Um, so I hadn't really thought about the dramaturgical practice. So it's been really interesting to kind of listen to it, but also to I'd written down four things to think about dramaturgy as therapeutic, um, as friendly as kind I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff in my mind at the moment about kindness and kindness with people so it's been really nice to have this discussion and to kind of hear kindness come up so much and then the fourth thing I wrote down was kind of personable to kind of recognize mm. that we are we are people and we are responding to each other as people and connecting as as people and um and yeah and that there needs to be space to kind of listen to us mm. so just to um, before I hand over to Lee for an outro, just um, thank you all again, Sudar, Samantha, and Kay. Yeah, it's been a really much. enjoyable discussion. And thank you to everyone that's, that's uh, listening in and for the questions that have come in. And I'll just hand back over then to, uh, to Lee. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say very briefly, I, thank you so much for the compassion and how incisive this conversation has been and for holding space for each other. It's been incredible. Um, and I just want to say a few things before we before we leave you all. Um, uh, I also want to thank the creators and signatories of the open letter, actually, the open letter we need to talk mm -hmm. about dramaturgy, because without that intervention, uh, and I hope many of you are in the audience watching and listening to this conversation as well, uh, but with, without that intervention, we wouldn't be having this fantastic conversation. And so you made that happen. And so thank you for that. Um, thank you, Lynette, Kane, Samantha and Sudar for being so insightful and generous and forthright in in your in your discussion and also for bringing so much of your own lived experiences as artists to this um, and how you navigate this these very unequal power structures in making work so thank you for that um, if you have day tickets and this goes for all of the audience watching as well um, these are valid for the remainder of the day's events so if you do have the rest of the evening free we will be reconvening in one hour for the kenneth tynan award ceremony um, so do join us for that if you can and um yeah and thank you to the organizers Catalin, sarah david tomo all of the team for helping me uh coordinate this and get you all together to have this amazing conversation um yeah thank you so much and that's that's all from me thank you Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Take care. See you soon, everyone. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.